In our previous HabitWise videos, we dealt with habits that are easy to recognize as problems, like eating potato chips and hanging out on the couch all night. So now that you're getting the hang of the habit loop, we're going to deal with the habits that can't be seen, but still have a big impact on our lives, our thinking habits. Let's look at how black and white thinking affects our relationships. When we rush into black and white thinking, we judge things in only extreme ways, like terrible or great, ugly or beautiful, or enemy or friend. But most of the time, black and white thinking isn't accurate because most situations aren't either all bad or all good. They fall somewhere in between, which is where the term gray area comes from. It's a mix of both. But we engage in black and white thinking because of our instinct to judge things as safe or dangerous. For example, let's imagine that certain conditions have allowed a well-preserved T-Rex to overcome that little extinction issue. It's been a few million years since he's eaten, so he's pretty hungry. Sophia only has a split second to figure out the best way to react because she's judged him as dangerous. So she hides in a store and the T-Rex moves on, considering whether he should go into this new era as a vegetarian. Okay, so in this case, the instinct to judge helped Sophia escape danger. But here's the issue. We often rush into black and white thinking in social situations too, even though it's not usually as simple as judging something as safe or dangerous. Sophia rushes into black and white thinking when she sees Alicia sitting in class on the first day of school. They have some friends in common, but they've never really gotten to know one another. But still, when Sophia takes a seat, she's surprised that Alicia doesn't say hi, smile, or even nod. Black and white thinking creates more drama in Sophia's mind than actually exists. Let's see how it follows the habit loop. Feeling uncertain about how the situation will turn out is the cue that starts Sophia's loop. It prompts the behavior of black and white thinking. Sophia jumps to the conclusion that Alicia hates her, even though Alicia's never said or done anything that suggests it. Black and white thinking gives Sophia a way to judge the situation, which gives her the satisfaction of settling her uncertainty. But there are negative side effects. Because Sophia thinks Alicia hates her, she expects Alicia to say or do something rude, so she avoids her, which gets kind of awkward sometimes. But just a small change to the way she thinks can help Sophia eliminate the negative side effects of black and white thinking. If Sophia approached the situation with Alicia again, she could replace black and white thinking with this behavior, exploring the gray area. When we explore the gray area of the situation, we think of the possibilities that could fall between the extremes of black and white thinking. Sophia jumped to the extreme conclusion that Alicia hates her. But that's not likely because they've never even spoken to one another. What's more likely are the possibilities that could fall into the gray area between the extremes of she hates me and she loves me. Maybe Alicia's shy. Maybe she's sleepy in the morning. Maybe she's distracted by her phone. Or maybe she could also be a little intimidated by Sophia. Exploring the gray area still gives Sophia the satisfaction of settling some of her uncertainty but it leaves room for her to get more information. It also removes the expectation that Alicia will be rude and the worry that goes with it. Black and white thinking affects more than just social situations. Whenever you feel uncertain about a complex decision, for example, deciding what kind of phone to buy, black and white thinking can make the situation seem simple. But if you think something like, this phone is great because it looks cool, the rest are terrible. Instead of comparing the features of each product, like price, camera quality, and speed, you may miss out on the best choice for you. Now, we're going to switch gears to talk about how to nurture a habit that can improve our relationships. Paraphrasing. Jaden got his first job doing yard work on the weekend for a family friend, Mr. Brown. For his first assignment, Mr. Brown told Jaden to plant flowers in rows. It seemed easy enough. But when Jaden showed Mr. Brown his finished work, Mr. Brown wasn't too happy with how Jaden arranged the flowers. Mr. Brown said that was not what he had in mind, and he wanted Jaden to dig them up and replant them. Jaden was pretty annoyed about having to start over. On the way home, Jaden told his mom that Mr. Brown was too picky, and he didn't think he wanted to keep working for him. Jaden's mom told him to hold up. Before he got carried away and quit the job, she suggested he tried to get in the habit of paraphrasing Mr. Brown's directions. 
To paraphrase means that you'll say in your own words what you think the other person means. Paraphrasing can help Jaden have a better time at his new job. Whenever he has the cue of Mr. Brown giving directions, he can paraphrase them in his own words and ask if he's got it right, which provides the satisfaction of clearing up any confusion. This will make it less likely that Jaden will make mistakes, waste time, or have difficulty getting along with Mr. Brown. Let's face it, difficult relationships make life stressful, but positive relationships help us deal with stress elsewhere in our lives because we get support from people who care about us, so habits that nurture them pay off. So, here's our pep talk. We're more likely to have positive relationships when we do our best to avoid thinking in black and white terms and instead explore the gray area and prevent misunderstandings by paraphrasing anything unclear in a conversation. Okay, so you just learned a lot about the psychology of habits. Now, you're in charge. It's time for you to use the habit loop to nurture and crush habits that matter to you.